That's my fear, that I'm not good enough. It's everybody's fear, but being courageous enough to push past that. But I think that fear that I'm not being good enough is what made me a good basketball player because I was so damn afraid of not being good enough to be where I was that I worked my butt off to be better. This G League story, the story of G League players, which is all about grit and all about resilience and all about chasing this dream, taking a shot at life. Well, this week's guest, we got a special one. I'm excited. We have the executive director of the Players Union, Literally an 18-year pro vet, basketball vet. He went to Columbia, also got his master's at literally Columbia. The way I do my podcast is I literally have these open flow, like I range conversations. And literally, I said Columbia twice. You literally got your undergrad from Cornell, then got a master's from Columbia. But I'm like, they're, they're brilliant schools. I'm like, this guy's brilliant, brave. He's bright. Man, thank you for joining the show, Jeff Aubrey. I uh, appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be able to chop it up with you a little bit. Yeah, I, I think it's um it's important because, you know, the space that you hold and, and the rank that you have now with younger players like myself and just, you know, the league as it is with the G League, it's huge to have somebody invested in us in this way. I've never had something like this for you to reach out. I think that's cool. But to start these podcasts and these conversations, I usually start with the formative years. And what you've been able to do 18 year pro career and then transition to this and then transition to this, we'll get into that, but it's, it's huge. And I always want to look at who that kid was then. So if you mm -hmm. take me back, let's say Jeff, let's say uh, pre twenties, what do you think were the most important things that worked to shape your perspective and shape your character? Oh man. Uh, I mean, I'll take it all the way back to kind of the, the beginning uh, of, of, you know, of me picking up that ball, uh, which, you know, is, is just a really important part of my life. Uh, it gave me identity. It, it helped give me structure. It, it taught me, um, you know, about persistence and courage and, you know, and teamwork. So so that's for me, like the best place to start. So I started playing at about 10 years old or so, um, mostly only because my, my best friends uh, were had, had started to get into basketball. And, you know, you're doing what your friends are doing. And um, like, Norris, I tell you, like to, to say I was a late bloomer is like an understatement. Right. I was <laughs> terrible, like awful. I was a big kid. I was always a big kid. Um, but slow and not athletic and, you know, whatever. So my friends used to kill me all the time. Like it was just what it was. Um, but you know, like I'm a competitor, right? So, you know, I, I kept working at it and I would try my hardest and still get killed. And that's just how it was going. And then, uh, then this one day, you know, my friends, because they were, they were my guys, like they cared about me. Right. They saw how hard I was trying and that I wasn't getting, having much success. So we were playing 21 uh, you remember 21, right? Everybody played 21. Yeah, of course. So it was three Everybody, of us playing yeah. 21. Yeah. And, and they let me win. And and that, like, it just snapped something inside me, right? Here is, you know, they had to let me win because I was that bad. So I took, like, my practicing, my training, even the, the way I looked at the game, to a whole nother level. It, it made me hungry. It made me angry. Um, and, and that, you know, might have been the best thing that ever happened to me. Because um, from them letting me win and me knowing that they had to let me win, I, I started putting a whole nother level of energy into becoming a better basketball player. And and wait, wait, mind you, it was a slow, slow climb. How did you go ahead? How did you know they let you win? Man, come on. Like, you know what I'm saying? They 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 weren't that slick. You know what I'm saying? It was it was it was hard for them to let me win. It wasn't even an easy let me win. Uh, I could just tell yeah. they, you know, they weren't trying, they were kind of easing off of each other, you know, and, and making sure I had opportunities to score, you know what I'm saying? It, it was, it was, it was a pretty obvious thing. So, you know, but the thought that they, that they had to do that, um, really, really, got, really pissed me off, really did. And then, um, I just took it to a whole nother level in terms of, of going after being better, you know, For, to take it to a no level, another level is one thing, but to even have the mindset mm -hmm. to do that is another, because it's like, if I'm you, in that time. And I pick up a sport that I wasn't playing just because they're playing. I'm just like, all right, I'm here with the boys, but I'm not trying to be the best. Like, where does that competitive right. nature come from? Because you pick up something that you're, you're foreign to. Yeah. You're huge. They're saying you could be great at this, but like you 
weren't and you didn't really care because they cared. That's why you care. So mm-hmm. where did that initial like passion that drive to be better to get pissed off because they let you win? Mm-hmm. Where did that come from? Uh, I mean, probably my mom. You know, my, my, I had the kind of parent, um, you know, uh, it, it was me and my mom. My dad was definitely in the picture, but, you know, I was I was, you know, living with my mom and she used to hit me with um, all the time. This was like the mantra she hit me with all the time was like, whatever you want to do. Like, I don't care what that is. Be the best at it. So she was like, so if one day you become a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher or a garbage man, like it doesn't matter, like be the best at what you what you choose to do. Um, she said, because that's the way you honor the gifts you have. Right. Um, you know, just like you, Norris, you know, I've been blessed with some some natural abilities, some natural gifts um, mm-hmm. and to to go out there and, and kind of just, you know, walk through life without giving all, you know, your all is is dishonoring the gifts that you've been blessed with. So, you know, that was always yeah. the, the thing for her is whatever you choose to do. And I don't care what that is. She was like, figure out something you love and then be the best at it. So that, you know, that that it's, just resonated with me always. And it was just a part of a part of who I became. It's who you became. It's funny. I read this thing once that said the stories of the father, uh, the stories of the father are Im- embedded in the son. The stories of the son are embedded of the father. But for you, it sounds like the story of the son is embedded in the mother. Like you could see, you know, who you're going to be because of her and, and how she was. How was she? And. In terms of parenting, I know she just you just alluded to her pushing you and striving for big goals. But like, how was she when you acted like when you came home and like, Mom, I'm pissed off. These kids let me win. Like, what was her response in those type of moments? Oh, man, my my mother, my mother was a fighter. Right. That was just who she was from from, the you know, the, the time she could, you know, she could stand up on her own. Um, so she was a fighter. So the me, the minute I told her what happened. And I, and I, you know, I told, I, she saw how angry I was about it. She was like, all right, so what are we going to do? You know, that means <laughs> she was like, if you want to be great at this, you have to, you have to eat, sleep and dream basketball. There's no other way. And then, you know, she helped me figure out some, some, some people who would work with me. She, you know, she, she got signed me up for basketball camp. You know, she helped me take it to another level because, you know, for her striving for greatness was the only way to live. So, uh, you know, she wanted me to be able to experience that and chase it all the way. And, you know, look, she she invested in me. Right. You know, um, none of that. None of that is 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 free. You know, you got to pay for basketball camps. You know, uh, back in my day, you didn't really have to pay for trainers the same way. Like it was usually somebody around the way that, you know, that knew how to play that would you know gladly show you something here or there. So it was always those kind of opportunities. But um, but she she helped me make it a priority in my life, you know, and she helped me to it. And, you know, like right. I said, she was a fighter, so she she taught me to fight. It's it's crazy because obviously what you're doing now, you, you went from player development and now you're executive director. We'll, we'll go to that definitely later. But it's funny how, you know, from that initial, you see how she invested in you and put you around people that also invested in you. In you. you see, after your playing career, you're coming back and investing in others. It's all like a full circle moment. Mm-hmm. Um, if you do take me back to that time behind your eyes in that area, I'm from Texas. I have no idea how, you know, literally Queens is New York is if I was behind your eyes in that time, I'm a tall, lanky kid. I'm pissed off. I'm probably how we think I'm probably on somebody's stoop on the stoop. If I get off mm-hmm. the stoop and I step into the street, roam the city, what would that day be like in your shoes? Yeah. So first off, um, uh, then my dad was in Queens, so I go back and forth. But mostly, I was in I was in a suburb of of New York. It's called it was called Uniondale, right? So Uniondale, interesting town. You know, um, all my friends growing up were black and brown, basically. Um, it was like a middle class, you know, uh, neighborhood. So we were we were in the backyards mostly. The parks in the backyards. That's that's how we were hooping. So for me, it was she immediately put a hoop up in our backyard. You know what I'm saying? She immediately was like, all right, well, it's out there. If you want it, go get it. Um, so so my days would look like, you know, going out in the morning to shoot, going out in the afternoon to shoot, getting my homework done, going back out, shoot some more, take the ball with me to school every day. You know, any chance there was a – anytime there was a ball bouncing in the neighborhood, I was out the door trying to find out who was playing to jump in a game. I mean, it was more like that. And then, you know, the thing I, I left out really is when you, you talk, talked about my mom's uh, influence – Aside from teaching me how to fight and and strive for something, like she believed I can do it, 
you know, and that 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 alone is a powerful thing for somebody to tell you to see you dream of something and then tell you that they earnestly believe that you can do it, that you can accomplish it um, is an amazing thing. Uh, and, you know, for me, I think you know, my mom passed uh, about seven years ago when I started at the NBA. Um, and, and I remember one of the last things I got to tell her was, you know, thank you for believing. Because if you didn't believe in me so much, I don't know that I would have ever believed in me that much. And and though that thing is something that not only I, I I ran with, but also something I try to put into, you know, put into 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 action when I'm working with guys, when I'm working with players, when I'm mentoring, you know, sometimes people just need somebody to believe as earnestly as they do, and even more so. Uh, I mean, that's right what a mentor is, right? Is when they see a path for you you can't even see yet, and then they believe mm. you can get there. So for me, like that that's that's the core of everything that I've been able to accomplish in my life is that I had somebody believing in me that much. Man, bro, I'm, I'm not, this is off script. I'm so inspired just by hearing that because it's like, that's how I think. And that's what I, I love to surround myself with people with that passion and that hunger and that fight. And it, obviously you have that, but going back to your story is, you know, it, it makes me think, you know, you join the NBA and you say, um, and thank you for sharing that about your mom that she passed before, like as you're stepping into this new stage, it gives me the thought like, okay, I know what to do with my life now. Like I'm, I'm on it now for her, for her legacy, for my family's legacy. And, and just to leave a, a better and for your whole lineage. So I, bro, that was, that's huge just to start. Um, but no, I think going back to your story again, I think during those times I asked about her because it's funny you know, you have the values. You say your mom's a fighter. She instilled that in you. She pushed that in you. She saw a greater belief that you can become somebody great. And, you know, the impressionable ages. You're impressionable. You are you weren't great at the sport and you wanted to be good. I always say 8 to 18. That's really when you're searching and you're finding yourself. And whatever you find through those ages sets the foundation of your life. So you have this fighter mentality that your mom put into you, but you have your own belief about how the fighter mentality should be. You know, you're behind in the backyard, but then you go to school and it's different kind of from what she saw. I guess, was there any friction in beliefs there? Like she wanted you to do this, but you're like, nah, I want to do it this way. Like, take me to those times. How did you work and stand in your own shoes? Like I'm the man, like I'm becoming yeah. somebody that I need to, you know, become. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, of course, man. I mean, look, no, no, no path is, 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 is a straight line. It's always a journey around, so it was staying encouraged when things weren't going well, you know, um, you know, making sure that I was dedicating the time uh, to the sport, not getting distracted by girls and friends and, you know, and the things that life starts throwing at you when you're, you know, when you're a teenager uh, was always a challenge. And then, you know, she she had to figure out her own life as well. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of that um, went into our story growing up. You know, I went to go live with my father when I was a teenager uh, that put me in Queens and, and just a way, a way different. Um, uh, it was just a different way of, of, of going after it. Right. I mean, different AAU experiences, different tournaments. And, you know, in, in New York, they, they used to have, again, you know what I'm saying? I'm, a little, I'm older, man. So park tournaments, right? So now where is mm -hmm. a AAU is a pay for play situation, right? So if you got the money, there's an AAU team for you. You can buy your way on a team, whether you're good or not. And you'll play in these tournaments. When I was young, you had to earn like you had to make a team. And if you didn't make a mm -hmm. team, well, this wasn't going to happen. You know, that's just what it was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, earning my way onto the court with players who were incredible. Right. I mean, I played with, you know, Ron Artest and I played with, you know, uh, guys, Sham God and, and against Stefan, uh, Stefan Marbury and against Felipe Lopez. And, you know, a number of guys who ended up in the league and high level D1. And man, there was a difference between them and me. And I knew it, you know, but. The, the willingness and the courage, and I mentioned courage in the beginning, to go out there and risk it and, 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 and challenge myself and, you know, know that, man, sometimes you're going to get killed and sometimes you're going to win one, but you got to go out there but and Jeff, put yourself what, on the line. Every what time. about when those times, not to cut you off, when those times you did mm -hmm. get killed, you got out on that court and you put yourself out there, you made yourself, you had mm -hmm. the courage to step up and be vulnerable and say, okay, I got to get mm -hmm. better. I got to compete. But then now you're in a different city in a different stage with your father now and you go back mm -hmm. home and you don't have that initial person of your mom pushing you kind of mm -hmm. walk me through those moments where, you know, you weren't there yet. So like it's hard to mm -hmm. have this vision and, 
you know, you're away from somebody that saw and championed the vision and poured into you. And now you're mm -hmm. in, quote unquote, a failure, a moment of tr like despair, a moment of, okay, mm -hmm. I, I failed at something. I don't know how to get back up. Like when you walk back mm -hmm. home, you took your ball, you took your shoes, walk back home to your new place. How did that feel? Yeah. I mean, it, it was interesting because a couple of things happened, right? So I'm playing in these park tournaments and having just kind of unremarkable games, you know, a couple points, a couple rebounds, a couple blocks, but nothing, nothing that stood out to anybody. Right. <clears throat> So I'm having those experiences pretty regularly. And then I'm playing, I'm playing my, my pops was six, eight, I'm six, nine, but you know, I, I grew all the way into college. So my pops used to go out and play with me all the time, one-on-one -on -one in the park. And, you know, he could hoop. He, he had been hooping, you know, high level park tournaments since he played in college. You know, he played in a small school in New Mexico. So we go out and he'd be laughing at me, killing me, killing me. Like he let me, we play in 11. He let me get to nine and then I wouldn't score another point. And he'd just be laughing, hitting me with all types of moves, hook shots, turn around Jays. I mean, everything. So, you know, here I am taking, like you said, I take my ball, stomp out the park. We both go into the same house. I'd be cussing <laughs> under my breath, man. Like, but I mean, it was, it was, they, my pops and my, and my mother both had different ways of, of supporting and encouraging me, right? My, my pops would never outwardly say, like, you're the best, you can be the best, you can do this, you can do this, like my mother did. My pops would do it very differently. My pops would be like, you know, you could probably do more in these games if you, if you, if you got your mindset to it. And then he wouldn't say another thing, you know, but um, in his quiet way, he let me know that he believed I was better than what I was shown. Um, and mm. then, you know, he would kill me on the court, but in killing me, he's showing me things, right? He's not, he's not teaching me or training me. He's just killing me. And then I'm seeing how he's doing it. I'm seeing what he's doing. I'm seeing what I, what I, what I do that doesn't work, what I do that does work. And then, you know, it was like a path we slow walked down. And then, um, you know, there was one game, man, like, you know, we'd be playing a couple games on a weekend and he, he decided he happened to bring me to this one game in this park tournament. And as we're walking to the court, he was like, you know, it'd be pretty cool if you had 20 points in one of these games. That's all he said to me. So I go out in this game with that in my head, and I think I ended up with 22, 24 points, something like that, and it was the first time I had scored probably more than 10 points in any of these games or any of these tournaments. <laughs> and it was literally off of him saying, not saying, you know, you could do this, but just saying it'd be pretty cool if you did that. Like, you know, it was almost like he knew I could do it. It was just, you know, him making sure I knew I could do it. And, you know, it was it was those kind of situations that like really helped me build to a space where, um, you know, I had enough confidence and, and drive to, to really go after what I what I wanted. Man, Jeff, I think that's elite, to be honest. And I'm not just saying that because, again, there's so many kids and so many people that they they face roadblocks, whether it's in their career, whether it's mm -hmm. on something that they want to start and they just internalize and they think that's on them. Like, OK, mm -hmm. you could have easily been like, I'm not good enough to play. Let me turn to something else. Like the fact that you kept going, they kept pushing and you became this 18 year pro career. I think like that that trait. I used to think it's normal, but it's not really normal. It's elite. Like <laughs> and to take it to a different place, you fast forward and you go to Cornell, your Cornell grad. So it's like the genius and the literally the traits to play sports that you didn't have before, but you grinded and you worked hard, but you're also like this, those two different worlds. I'm like, one, why go to Cornell when you already, your mind says, okay, I'm going to do basketball. I'm going to focus on basketball. I'm going to grind towards this. I'm going to get my ass whooped. I'm going to get embarrassed, get humiliated, but I'm going to become a better player like you did. But why focus also on the academic part part of it and go to Cornell? Yeah. So um, part of it was, like I said, I, I kind of knew who I, I was self aware, right? So I'm playing against guys who are, who are like they're doing it. They're high level D one players. They're top prospects. Like they were all over the New York City area at that time, right? Tim Thomas and Zendon Hamilton and all of these guys. So I knew I wasn't there, right? So obviously, you know, I'm I'm, I'm gifted in academically. I always have been. Um, you know, I learned to work hard, but for a while it was just kind of came easy to me. So, you know, the first D1 school that came sniffing around was Cornell, an Ivy League school. Um, so I kind of jumped at that opportunity, man. I went on a visit, one visit. That's all I took was one visit. Uh, I met a, a group of brothers, you know, who are still my best friends today, um, who I was like, man, I was like, these dudes think about things out, out, out in the world in, in, in similar ways to, that I do. 
you know, they're being challenged in these kind of ways. I was like, man, this is this is somewhere I could see myself. And, you know, I applied and boom, I was in and made the decision right away. Like, this is where I'm going to school because, you know, I knew, look, I had NBA dreams like everybody else. But I was mm-hmm. also very realistic to know that I was not an NBA player and definitely not at that point. And matter of fact, but, most people who know me from that time would never believe I played I played professionally for as long as I did. That's my point. So y- you mm-hmm. kept ascending. You kept getting better and better. So why didn't you – it's like a ceiling on your basketball potential, but everything else, you're like, I can grow in different areas. They're, these guys right. that I met, they're into different things, the life itself, not just sports. Mm-hmm. I can grow in all aspects of my life, but it's almost like you had a ceiling on basketball. Why, though? Uh, I mean, I think it goes to your the, the term you've, you've coined, you know, um, mind bu- bully, right? Like, you know, my inner voice – never let me believe I could be better than what I was currently. Um, you know, I had moments. Look, I had moments, right? You know, we're playing we're playing my senior year against Oak Hill Academy. You know, Oak Hill is loaded, as always, you know, um, and, you know, they beat us by 20 or, you know, 30 or like Oak Hill always does. Uh, and, man, you know, some point in the game, you know, I probably had my best high school game against them. You know what I'm saying? I, mm. I, caught, I caught one off the rim and dunked on two of their 6'10 guys <laughs> and, you know, and surprise myself, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, and, and after that, you know, um, Bob Gibbons, who was a big time scout at the time, he was like, wait, that kid is going to an Ivy League school. He was like, man, they got the biggest steal of this recruiting class. So it's like moments like that, little successes that started bringing me, um, you know, closer to a realization of, you know, maybe that ceiling isn't as low as I think it is. You know, um, yeah. but but this was a long process, man. And and I was lucky enough to play on a really good high school team um, and definitely was not the best player. Wasn't even the best. You know, I, I started my senior year, my junior year. I was definitely coming off the bench. So, you know, it was a push to be where I was. But, you know, incrementally, man, I, I was making strides. And, you know, it took a while before my brain, you know, understood, you know, what the rest of me was going to be able to do. What the rest of you was able to do, Cornell grad, then you go to this 18-year pro career. I guess my question would be for this. I literally, like, I've been in one (laughs) year overseas. I played in Germany, and I had a tough experience. But I think that affords you and awards you something when you're over there with a different culture, different people, seeing and working with people from all different walks of life in terms of your now player development and teaching what do you think Mm -hmm. your 18 year pro career with 12 different countries including the u.s Mm -hmm. nine different championships you've seen a lot of life and you've seen a lot of life on how it's done in different places how Mm -hmm. does that help you in this new thing that you're doing now with teaching kids and player development and pouring back and seeing how different people work with each other well i got to be i think you know, I, like you said, I got to see a lot of life. I got to live a lot of life. Um, you don't you don't last overseas without having a sense of adventure. Like you got to be up for it because it's going to be good. Sometimes it's, it's going to be bad. It's going to be terrible. Um, you know, and and you have to be up for the experience and then willing to throw yourself in and take some risks. And that could be learning a new language, trying to learn a new language or speak it, which, you know, is is challenging itself. It means being up for, you know, new foods, new, new customs, you know, to it means being comfortable being lost, like going into a city you've never been in with a map because, you know, I went before cell phones were really a thing and, and just saying, you know what, I'm going to find my way. Now, that all comes with a quiet confidence to know that, you know, just at some level you're, you're good enough to do it. And then it just, you know, the willingness to take that first step out the door. I, I mean, I remember my first time in Europe. I was in Spain. Um, you know, I got off the plane. The owner picked me up, took me to my apartment. I took a nap and I woke up in the middle of the day and I was in this new city with no idea where I was, how I was going to get there. I mean, I, I didn't even know how to call home. You know what I'm saying? And And that experience gave me confidence for the next one. And then confidence for the next one and then confidence but for the Jeff, next one not to a in point that where moment I'll, not in that me moment not to cut world, you off and I'm gonna be fine. not to cut you off Go ahead. not in that moment though in that moment there's no way it gave you that oh i'm a, i'm a, i'm like oh hell no they just dropped me off i can't call home i'm by myself in this new city like i don't know where anything is i couldn't imagine without a a smartphone i got a map i'm just like and 
living conditions that like obviously as you scale up in your career you get to different places mm -hmm. but like early on you're like i'm just out in the walls like mm -hmm. what did that feel like and like why did you keep going 18 yeah. years why uh i mean at that first time it was it was it was a little terrifying but um but i think look i wanted i wanted to see how far i could take basketball i wanted to see so that was the option in front of me so that's what i went after and, you know, and all honestly, like, you know, you got to chase the things that make you feel alive. And at that time, basketball is what made me feel alive. And if I had to play, you know, um, you know, a thousand feet underground or in a skyscraper or in the middle of the ocean, wherever I had to go to play, that's where I was going to play. And um, and I was still just finding, you know, what what was going to be possible. And then, you know, like I said, in terms of, you know, the, the courage part. You know, this is what I learned from basketball. You know, it, courage doesn't mean anything if there's if you're not afraid. You know what I'm saying? You gotta you gotta be afraid of something to be courageous enough to step past it. And uh, and that, if anything else, was probably the most important lesson I learned in my 18 years. You know, being overseas, you can drop me anywhere in the world, and I have a sincere belief that I'll figure out what to do, how to do it, and be successful at it. And and just to even like have a tangible moment there something i can take because i i just i can re relate with what you're saying but for me just hearing that i would like to hear from that moment because mm -hmm. you know you're somebody that is curious of your abilities curious of your traits and as you're growing to put yourself voluntarily like i said i'm in a different country now it was a different experience i went to germany during covid rosa bamberg three-story house nice living so it was totally <laughs> different and i didn't like it <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, all right, let me get back to the States for you to right. stay in something that was totally different. Like when you were had those tough moments and you were afraid and you didn't have it kind of how did you work to get, you know, have that feeling again? Like I'm here for a reason. One, two, I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay curious and, and make my thought of, OK, this thing makes me feel alive is way more important than how I feel right now about where I'm, I'm living and where I'm going. Like, how did you mm -hmm. resonate and just feel comfortable again? Um, you know, I, I think I, I embrace the discomfort. There's something to learn every time you're challenged or there's adversity. Right. There's something to learn there. Um, I had been through enough at that point in my life that I wasn't surprised by it. And I also, um, I think, embraced, again, the adventure of it. You know what I'm saying? I grew up watching Indiana Jones. And, you know, and for me, like, that, that is the coolest thing, right? You get off a plane in some, you know, some third world country and, you know, and there's a quest and you're challenging. I mean, it, it sounds corny and ridiculous, but it's literally how I saw myself. Every time I was driving through Europe, I thought I was like James Bond, some secret spy, <laughs> like, in my imagination. You know, but this is how you work yourself up. To, to, yeah. to taking these challenges on head first, right? I mean, you know, and, and look, everybody has different fears, right? Some people are afraid of speaking in public. Some people are afraid of, you know, you know, cats. Some people are afraid of, of, you know, getting in a body of water, right? Everybody has their own different fears, right? I mean, Norris, you, you step in front of this camera and this mic and talk a couple times a week with such confidence. And this would terrify a lot of people, like terrify them. And you do it like it's nothing because it's something you've practiced at, you're comfortable with. So it's just like that. You're flexing a muscle that you've developed over time. And, you know, that that ability to go into these, you know, whatever city. And look, Spain was easy. Looking back, Spain was the easiest first job I could have ever had. There were some places that it got dicey and it was dangerous and, you know, and it was unpleasant. And, you know, it was a bigger challenge. But, you know, little by little, I prepared myself. I steeled myself. And, you know, it, it comes to a question of, how bad do you want something and, and what are you willing to sacrifice for? It? You know, but at the what end of the day, look, everything you want is on the other side of pain, fear and boredom. <laughs> I've never heard that, but I like that a lot because it's so true when you're in the monotonous, the mundane, the grind, the same old, mm -hmm. same old, same old. It's like you get bored, but you still have that kind of mentality to psych yourself out is what I call it. Like when I was over there, I was also like, okay, I'm a, I literally got dreads. I said I was going to get tatted. I got pierced because I want to become somebody else. And then when I come back, right. it's like, so you got to give yourself and almost play a character and, and help right. you get to the next level. That's so crazy. But if I'm you again, 
and you won nine championships. And there's something that you said in your form that was so funny to me. It's like your last year you were a champion and you go from, okay, I'm going to hang up the shoes <laughs> and then I'm going to go to the NBA and be an intern. And I'm thinking, I'm like, bro, God, I love God. I serve God. I'm a servant, but there's no way. That's such a humbling experience to go from a high of, I've had all these different experiences. Like, I know I'm the big dog. I should, I know how to win. I know how to lead. I know how to be around people from different cultures that don't even speak my language. I know how to be in these rooms. Y'all haven't been where I've been to go and open your eyes, literally go back to school, now hard school, Columbia, and literally take an internship. That humbling experience. Walk me through those conversations through your head when you thought and you ran into that position. Hmm. I mean, I mean, I think I was I was in a clear understanding that I was stepping into a new a new realm and a place where I was going to learn. I also walked in with very little ego. Right. The things I had achieved as a basketball player had some relevance. You know, I was working in a basketball league, but not enough relevance that I could walk in and puff my chest out like I'm better than anything. Right. I don't think I'm better than anybody. I think the things I've accomplished, you could easily accomplish. Anyone can easily accomplish. You know, it's a matter of how bad you want them and how what you're willing and if you're willing to sacrifice for them. That's it. Um, you know, I knew that my my time was had come to an end. I was lucky that I got to walk away from the game when I was ready and not the game walking away from me. And and most of the time it's the other way. Like, you know, people don't retire, they are retired. You know, they stop getting those phone calls, they stop getting the contracts. And, you know, and then they, they, they're, you know, they're scrambling, looking for what life is going to bring next. That's a tough place to be, man. And I completely relate. Um, and, you know, there's no, you know, forget it. No, no lack of gratitude on my part that my situation was different. But like, again, it wasn't a straight line. You know, I spent hours, hmm. you know, up at night researching jobs, applying to coaching jobs, trying to figure out what I was going to do next. I have, you know, I have three kids. I'm married. And I had people to support and mouths to feed. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to do that past basketball. And man, it was, again, terrifying, terrifying, mm. you know, in terms of, you know, a new world. You know, I'm stepping out of a world I, I completely understood. I'm an expert at into one that I have very little of understanding about. Going to grad school was one of my ways to anchor myself and prepare myself for the new challenge. But, um, but it was really about controlling your ego. Um, when I was an intern, uh, and this, this is a one funny little incident, I was working in G League basketball ops, and they had to like, you know, sort T-shirts or jerseys or something for the for a training camp. And it was like literally dumb work, right? You know, take the sizes out, <laughs> yeah. separate them, put them in a box. So I was like, yo, I'll do it. And and one of my, you know, my my fellow staff members was like, no, 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 no. It's just, it's just dumb work. This is like grunt work. This is nothing, you know. And I was like, and? Like, I'm an intern. I'm here to do everything. You know what I'm saying? I'm not here to sit at the desk and watch you work. I'm here to get my hands dirty. I'm here to figure out how this place works. I'm here to figure out how I can stay here. And, you know, sometimes you got to sweep a floor. That's what it is. You know, so bro, that's what I, I did. I love that, bro. I I, I love that because I, I know that's winning. And like, you know, that's winning. And from from that and seeing you sweep the floors, doing the the, the dumb work, the grunt work, you go from an mm -hmm. intern to the director of player development and now to executive director, next gen players union. Mm -hmm. It's so funny again, because of this form, I'm like, um, does he, does he got his time wrong? He was like from seven years, finally executive director of the players gen. And, you know, literally the union started in 2020. So I'm like, uh, either his math is wrong. Then I'm like, Oh, like, bro, for you to have a mindset, okay, you changed careers. Now you're an intern, but you had that vision, that mindset for more, pushing for more. I want to set this goal to be this person to a position that's not even here yet. Or I had this vision for where I'm at, the G League, and pouring into younger players. I want to build off of this. I have so much in me, that passion, that grind, mm -hmm. to, to be able to set that far away and work for it for almost seven years. I'm like, oh, like... The thing was, it, it was crazy because basically the union was started in 2020, three years ago. But he said he's been working for this before it even was a thing. So it's so, it's so amazing and it's incredible what I learned from your story. It's like grinding, growing, keep working, even if you don't see it, keep going, keep going. And then you create your own evidence as you work. 
you start, okay, they, okay, I see this kid. He's in here. He's passionate. He's about the right things. I see how he works with players. Okay, like, what's his voice? Okay, he's passionate about this. I see him. And so it's it's so funny when I saw you at um, the Winter Showcase, G-League Showcase short story. We were in Vegas, and they appoint uh, a player from every other team. And I was our point for Greensboro Swarm before they gave me the boot. Whatever. I was there for two hours in this meeting about the players union, just trying to take on counsel on what we should do the next steps for the league. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, we're about to vote for a candidate to be executive director. And basically you're the only person that was there to pitch himself and to pour into himself and, and to pour into like his vision, his passion. And to be honest, I was asking the questions before the whole meeting started at the meeting. Then when you came in, I was asking questions, questions. And it's just like, you don't know what somebody has done to prepare for this moment. And and I saw you before and I was like, okay, I like what he's about, but I want everybody to see what he's about. So I'm going to test him in this way. But I don't know. I'm just, I'm almost at a rabbit hole going circles, but I'm like, I'm so grateful to have you on this podcast one, but to have you as a, you know, executive director, I, cause I know you're about the right things. And just speaking of that whole situation, I guess, what was it like when you got the call? when you finally uh, became the executive director. Yeah. No, I mean, man, look, it was it was just it felt like a a a a full circle moment, right? You know, um so when I went to Cornell, my undergrad was in industrial and labor relations. Um I grew up going to union meetings with my grandfather. Um my mother was in a union, my grandmother was in a union. Um you know, so I I understood the impact that the labor movement has had on on the American economy. And literally like the American prosperity is rooted in, in, in the development of, of labor unions in this country. So understanding that history and being seeped in it because of, again, my, my personal story and then my, my, my studies in undergrad, you know, I have a huge understanding of what it could mean to be unionized for G League players. Um, it also puts me in a servant role. Right. Which which for me is the core of everything. Right. What what I love so much about basketball. And it took me a while to figure this out. What I love is that it is five of us or 10 of us, depending on how you look at the team, all with a common goal, all with the same understanding of how we're going to achieve that goal. Like there is power in that, man. I mean, and that's what drives me every day to know that I represent you and 300 other G League players. And I fight for you every day because we are all looking for the same thing. And we're all going to agree on how we get there. You know, I'm part of a team and that team for me means everything. It is the most normal thing for me. It connects to my basketball career. It connects to my education. It connects to every other job I've ever had. I work for and with people I care about, period. That's it. And there's too many people in this world that don't have an opportunity to say that every day they get up and go to work. Yeah. Yeah. I guess even on the G League side now, what would you and how do you make change? Because, again, I think as a player, I have my own thoughts. And and honestly – for me, it's like I think the G League should be profitable. The the literally where they practice, the arena is just you know everything around the player. They're pro basketball players. Right. That's what I think, and I'd love to right. hear your opinion on that because how do you move forward in a space in a stage where kids make money in college, then they come here, it's a demotion, right. and you're losing basically all your top talent to overseas because they're like, I'm not staying here for this. Like, what do you? think and I know there's so many hats so many behind the scenes you you don't hold everything in you know you work with a team as well but in your opinion like how do you make change I mean I think you know this is a this this league is growing it's an emerging market it's an emerging league and it is still growing and developing you're talking about 22 years later you know when I played in the G League D League you know the conditions were um, not nearly as good as they are today we bust everywhere there were only eight teams so the growth is there Right. Um, And what I've seen from those days is humongous. Now, there's still tons of room for improvement. And it's about uh, us figuring out the ways that this G League story, the story of G League players, which is all about grit and all about resilience and all about chasing this dream, about taking a shot at, at life. Right. You're taking a shot at a dream that will resonate with everybody. And once we're able to connect those stories, I think with the general public, we'll find more fans. You'll find people who are intrigued by what's happening, who are intrigued by guys who go out there every night, lay it all on the line because they are chasing a dream. And, you know, for me, 
that's got to be the core of how you make this league grow in terms of revenue and opportunity. We need more eyeballs, you know, and we need to continue allowing this thing to grow. I think players coming in with with NIL deals has already put them on a on a on a different level, on a different platform. They're already embracing, you know, kind of their images. And, you know, now we got to figure out ways to grow that once they get to the G League to hold that value. And then knowing, I think, that growing the G League is going to happen likely slow, right? Um, we got Portland in. Portland's just joined. We're still missing one NBA team. Phoenix is missing the G League team. Um, but once we're at 30 G League, 30 plus G League teams, but 30 NBA teams have G League affiliates, now we're really going to see how their investment in the G League teams can grow based on the talent that's coming in. You're talking about half the league having G League experience. Half the league right now. That number is going to go up. It's the most important tool you could possibly have to develop NBA talent. So now the players who you know may not get to an NBA floor are still important because you got to play against somebody. You got to develop against somebody. And there are players with tons of experience that are teaching that you know that younger players get to learn from and there is a huge amount of value in what they're bringing and we just got to figure out ways for them to be compensated for bringing that expertise that value and that experience to the league now there's room to grow and we got to be creative this is a startup so um, you know we're, we're we're thinking of ways now to to put ourselves in a better position yeah whenever you have big dreams little resources it's yeah like you said create like you got to create, be creative, and 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 that will turn the tide. I guess when you have players, or even from a fan perspective that doesn't understand, kind of you know the G League versus the NBA, kind of what is the NBA's incentive to fund or to have a G League team? Because like you just said, there's not all teams have a G League team. So what is their incentive, and how do you go about making it a a more of a priority for them, in your opinion? All right. So I think there's two ways that they're looking at the league, right? One as uh, as, you know, a revenue driver, like a league that can stand on its own, make its own money. And I think there's definitely opportunity for that. And then the other is as a research, a research and development tool, which is a completely different thing. Right. Tons of companies, Google, Apple, like they pour money into R&D, research and development. Right. They want to figure out new ways to do things, better ways to do things, develop their staff, develop their technology. Um, the G League is hugely valuable like that right now, like hugely valuable. And us being able to um, help teams understand the value that players bring to that space is 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 part of the fight. Now, the 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 creating revenue on its own is the space where I think has the most room for growth. There is where we can now start leveraging digital platforms. We can leverage individual player platforms and brands to now bring more eyeballs to the game. Look, I spent the first couple of weeks of my of my tenure here going to G League games, as many as I could. And I saw, you know, what I saw was talent. I saw ability. I saw excitement, you know, and, you know, I think getting the fans in the building is the most important part. Getting eyeballs on the games is huge because they're going to see what I saw and they'll be excited by what they saw. And the ability to be close to guys, to have engaging conversations after the game, to be, you know, in those atmospheres is going to be really attractive because live sports is the only thing holding up, you know, the, the, the television industrial complex, a TV deal is going to be huge because live sports are the only reason anybody has TV. That's it. And (laughs) G league can be a part of that. No, I, I definitely agree on that point because even from a player's perspective, you know, I was with two teams, Texas legends and they're fans and, Mm -hmm. and they really make it a scene. And it's a beauty to see, honestly, it's like, why aren't, you know there's coverage on this every single time so it's like you walk in there you're like okay i'm charged i feel like for me i'm like dang like i haven't had this much fun with fans and signing autographs out of the game since texas tech like that's really cool but then you get in your car after the game and then you go to the hotel that they got us in and it's a different mindset and for a lot of players listening and for, for a lot of players it's just frustration because it's like i was on this g league team and it was this way but I was on this G League team and it was this way. It's totally different. And so, you know, the fans are getting to see, okay, I'm seeing this emerging league, this talent, like, woo, like we're fans, but the player doesn't feel like a player, doesn't feel like a pro. Like, and so what would you say to athletes or players that kind of, all right, bro, 
they're not buying it. They feel like a guinea pig to, like you said, R&D. Like, I'm just a lab rat for the NBA, diggling this treat and paying us a little money chasing this dream. How is it going to be any different? Like, why should it be any different? What would you say to a player that says that? Right. I mean, look, the the consistency of a player experience, uh, in, 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 regardless of the team, I think is a big point of emphasis for me. Uh, I want a player who plays at every team to have the same kind of experience, not the exact same, but same living conditions, same opportunities, same access to resources. Like that's a huge thing for me. But uh, in convincing players to come, like there's so much opportunity there. And look, I, I'll be honest, and I said this, you know, when when I stood in front of you guys, um, you know, when I'm introducing myself for the role, like playing in the G League was the best business decision I made because it connected me to this NBA family and these NBA resources. And it can be that same opportunity for you guys. That internship that we talked about in the early parts of, the, of, the, of, uh, of our conversation only happened because I played in the G League. So forget Cornell, forget Columbia. None of that happens if I didn't play in the G League. Right. So it's all about leveraging your talents and your abilities to put you in a better position, you know, to, to build the life you want. And this is one way to do it. Now, that that life could lead you to the NBA. You could be on an NBA floor. You could get a call up. You can sign a multi-year deal like we had guys who did that this year. Right. Incredible. Or it could help you build something outside of that, something that's more lasting and, and something that's just as fulfilling. Right. Those opportunities are there, but you got to give yourself a chance, you know, and I'm not saying, look, come to the G League, stay forever, though. I think there's (laughs) there should be some meaning in that kind of career. But I am saying Mm -hmm. that you're opening the door for yourself to have incredible opportunities post post career and in your career. Look, we are the most it's the most heavily scouted league in the world. You got scouts all the time and people knowing who you are, believing who you are and seeing you grind every day. It's going to resonate with them and those opportunities will come afterwards. Those opportunities will come. And I I do think, you know, we could agree to disagree on a lot of different things there, but it is a challenging situation. And you are definitely a person up for the challenge, just the passion and and the drive that you have towards it. It's just like, it has me thinking, it's like a sense of responsibility that you have, but like, do you feel an obligation? And and I know you're going to say yes, but like, what, what is the obligation? What do you feel obligated to provide to do in this stage in your life not only for you know for the players that you're in charge of the vision and that that way but just for you personally what are what do you feel obligated to do uh i mean for me it's pay it forward you know so many people poured into me um so many people really you know took time to 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 teach me to learn me to 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 you know to uh to love on me i mean you know look i just want to give that back um, to someone else who needs it. You know, uh, we started off and I told you how sincerely my mom believed in my ability to do anything. And I want to be able to be that, um, you know, that kind of encouraging mentor for, for, for guys coming after me. And, um, you know, the, the, what you can do for other people is what drives me every day, right? It's, it's not about, you know, what, what I can do for me. It is about what I can do for you. And, um, and that's a powerful motivator, man. And, and that's what makes everything I do meaningful, whether it be, you know, organize, you know, a, a player meeting or, you know, put together a PowerPoint slide. You know, I'm still sweeping floors. I'm still doing the grunt work. It's what made me successful as a basketball player. And it'll make me successful in this role. And that success is for you is for players who are in the G, the players who will come into the G and, you know, and and all the future players that will end up playing in this league. I want to make sure it's a better place and it's a better opportunity. Yeah, you said that in your form to build something that outlasts you. And I think that's honestly, obviously, admirable from a sense of, okay, you're a father, you're a leader, you're a champion, wanting to leave that, you know, the people that poured into you from your mom, her legacy alive, and wanted to build off of that, leave your footprint not only in your family's life, but in other young men's life and just a league's life and leave that create a union that that that's so cool um and there's so many people honestly that aren't about the right things in this business and i've seen it and it's like it's hard to say because you know when you meet that person they won't ever say like hey i'm about the wrong things but you really know Mm -hmm. since you see those people that you really know a person when they're about the right thing so i know that you'll you'll take this and run with it so i'm appreciative to have you on this platform but i always ask this question 
overcoming your negative voice, that inner critic that says, okay, you're executive director. You were just sweeping floors. You shouldn't even be here. Why do you think that you can make any change where you're going to those meetings with the NBA team? Why do you think you should get any headwind with these conversations? Because nobody else behind you did. David Foster, he's a genius. He didn't get any headwind. Why do you think you, you, you just a tall, lanky kid that just played basketball. You switched careers. When you have that inner critic in your moment and you're now telling you, you can't do these things that you want to do and what you want to accomplish, a dream, a vision that you can't even see. How do you work through overcoming your mind bully? Man, um, you go back to courage, right? You know, um, that's my fear, right? That I'm not good enough. It's everybody's fear. Um, you know, but being courageous enough to push past that. Um, but I think that that fear that I'm not being good enough is what made me a good basketball player. Because I was so damn afraid of not being good enough to be where I was that I worked my butt off to be better. Always, to the last day I played. You know, uh, my last game, you know, pregame, we were about to close out in the finals. And my pregame routine was exactly the same. I pulled the ladder out. I lifted weights before I got out there. You know what I'm saying? I got my shots up. I got in a full sweat. I ran sprints. I did all of those things because that work is the only thing that keeps that voice quiet. Got to trust your work. That's it. Trust the work. Man, honestly, I'm, I'm, this is so cool. This is so cool. It's an honor to have you on. It's a privilege because everything you said in this, in me, I'm like, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, it's like from somebody who gets it on the other side and it's potent and I can feel it. I, I'm grateful. I'm thankful to have you on this podcast because I know this message, it just helped me. So anybody that will listen to this, little kids, older people, everybody different stages in their life and their career listens to this that are encouraged with having somebody literally change from this, change from this in transition, dealt with that tension in the transition, had felt the fear, but didn't leave that fear in front of him as a roadblock. Like he pushed past it. He utilized the fear. And, and now he's to places that he, you know, he didn't even see, but now he wants more and more and more. And he's hungry, curious in himself. I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast, man. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate you, Norris, and, and thanks for having me. And also, man, thanks for having these kind of conversations, man. I mean, there's so few people who who get to understand that what they see on the court is not all all we are. We're so much more than that. And um, and you demonstrate that uh, every day that that you show up and have these conversations and and talk about what it means to to show up every day and keep working and keep doing your thing and and quieting that that inner voice. So uh, I appreciate you, man, and the work you do here on this cast.